bigger changes though, during the period, though, are probably in uh, our culture generally and our consumption. U.S. becomes culturally homogenous, meaning that uh, the movies and the music people are listening to in New York City are going to be similar, if not the same, as California and Texas and so on and so forth. Uh, we th th this is a given today as we all basically watch the same TV shows and listen to the same music and, and all that. But that doesn't really begin until the 1920s. Cultural divisions now will not be based on region, they'll be based on class, uh, essentially income, which as you can see has race baked right into it because income is largely dependent upon your race. Spending for pleasure, not just for needs, uh, is going to become a new way, uh, American way of life. Back in the old agricultural society that is being replaced here, uh, you rarely ever spent money. You basically made what you needed at home, and spending money was a big deal. Uh, you probably didn't make purchases most days or maybe even most weeks. But, of course, uh, we're beginning to get into that new world where we're buying stuff all the time. Refrigerators, washing machines, vacuums, wristwatches, uh, cigarettes, cosmetics, fashion are all things that we're going to buy. And here you see some appliances from the period, uh, which are fun. But mostly what we're going to be obsessed with are cars. By the crash uh, in 1929, there will be 30 million cars in America. When the movie The Grapes of Wrath, which is about uh, uh, people who've been struck by the Depression, uh, farmers who are leaving Oklahoma, desperately trying to feed themselves, going to California looking for work, is shown to communist Russia. The Russians are amazed that even the poor Americans have cars. The cars become so ubiquitous that we even have this idea that e even poor people can have a car. This culture is created on purpose by advertising men. Uh, these companies, they want to sell stuff. Um, the advertising industry evolves from the Committee on Public Information, that war propaganda in, uh, a group that tried to get us all to support World War I. A lot of those people who had figured out techniques to get people to buy liberty bonds or support the war in World War I will now move into the private sector to try to figure out how to get you to buy pantyhose or new suits or uh, uh, cigars. Advertising uh, uh, basically says that consumer happiness or the consumption leads to happiness and status. People will think you're a better person if you have better clothes, and if you buy these things, you'll be happy. Of course, we see this all the time today, this association with any product you can think of and, and being happy. The ad man Bruce Barton will write a book, The Man Nobody Knew. This is about Jesus, and in his book he explains that Jesus was really just the first of the great advertising men. Uh, that, that Jesus was promoting living a full and rewarding life through consumption. And, you could, and how could you be like Jesus? What would Jesus do? To go back to our question from the progressives, well, Bruce Barton said Jesus would buy lots of consumer goods and live a happy, fulfilled life. Uh, there's a great story I need to tell here. Um, Joseph Lister had developed a product called Listerine, which, which would, of course, uh, kill um, uh, bacteria. And he sold it to hospitals. And by the 1920s, pretty much every hospital in America is buying this stuff to wash their tools in. Um, and, but sales are flat. I mean, they sell it to all the hospitals. But, of course, being a corporation, they constantly want to grow. And so they, an ad man came up with the idea of inventing a new disease, uh, 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 chronic halitosis. And Listerine is going to be the cure for this new disease. So this is a great example of creating a disease and then selling you the cure. Um, and they had this, this amazing series of ads with this poor guy named Marvin. And he couldn't get a date. Uh, his grandmother didn't want to be around him all because he had chronic halitosis. He had bad breath. And, and, of course, once he buys the Listerine, he's happy now because his breath smells and people like him again because apparently that's what relationships are based on. Not that I'm promoting bad breath, but it's a wonderful example of something nobody thought they needed in 1910 and everybody decided they needed by 1925. We also go to the movies. Uh, by, by, by the way, the, the advertising at this point is done on uh, in newspapers and magazines and radio, of course, primarily. Let's talk about the movies. In 1930, which is the first year of the Great Depression, of course, 100 million people go to the movies. This had been 40 million people in 1922. The movies have become a national obsession. In 1927, The Jazz Singer is the first talking movie. You see it there in that black and white uh, uh, photo on the top. Of course, this is unfortunately a guy in blackface, Al Jolson, doing this. The movies were right from the beginning kind of scandalous. Uh, they were, of course, fairly sexual and uh, uh, violent uh, uh, for the time. Um, and there was also a series of scandals. There was a lot of uh, rumors about um, a, a woman named Clara Bow, who I have a picture of later, and, and her kind of being uh, loose. And then a, a guy named Fatty Arbuckle, a comedian, uh, killed a prostitute. He smothered her uh, on accident, I think. 
Um, and, and, and so the movies began to get a bad reputation. And so the movies voluntarily decided to censor themselves, and they created the Motion Picture Administration uh, to make sure that there wasn't anything being put out in movies that people might find offensive. And the result was blander, more commercial movies, um, and, and, and really moving away from controversial subjects um, or things that might be considered racy or offensive. Movie theaters, I should mention, by the way, would, would only have one screen. There weren't multiplexes. And they were beautiful. Um, here are uh, the movie theater, a couple of movie theaters. Um, uh, and these were the old movie palaces. And it would be something more like going to a play or an opera than, than maybe we think of going to the movies today. We had the first public radio station uh, in, uh, in 1920. In, it was KDKA in Pittsburgh. The very first thing it broadcast was the 1920 presidential election. NBC, the National Broadcasting Corporation, became the first network. Um, so it would produce shows and they would be syndicated and broadcast all over the country. That was in 1927. In 1927 as well, the Radio Act creates the Federal Radio Commission to regulate the corporations who are broadcasting on the radio. By 1935, that becomes the, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. The courts also declare the airwaves to be public property, which means they are essentially rented from the government. Uh, the, the airwaves that they're actually broadcasting on, and that gives the government the right to regulate them. Now, back in the day, music was played live on the radio, so the band would actually come in and play on the radio, at least uh, uh, frequently. And they would also do lots of stories. Uh, we have comedians. That's uh, uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen up there on the top right. You see over there all the sound effects they have to tell a story. And a lot of things like the Lone Ranger or the Shadow, which you may have heard of today, um, those all started as radio stories that then transitioned over to TV. And everybody listened to the radio all the time. People cried around their radio like people used to cry around their, 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 uh, their TVs, and today they cried around their computers and their cell phones. Um, this was where it was at. This was what entertainment meant uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s for that matter. Um, 